From 1810 to 1850, over 30,000 Americans escaped slavery in the South to freedom in Canada via the Underground Railroad, a network of brave abolitionists, safe houses, and secret routes zigzagging across the North. Today we are at the Grau Millen Museum in Oak Brook, Illinois, a stop on the Underground Railroad and a working grist mill. I'm Brianna Borger and this is Yesterday Today. the Grau Mill Museum. This is Sandy Brubaker, Executive Director of the Museum. Thank you for having us today. Oh, you're welcome. I'm always glad to have uh, people like you come out and, and see us and find out what we're all about. Great. Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, what would you like to tell us about the museum here? Well, I think you, you need to know that the buildings and grounds are actually owned by the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County. And they do the maintenance on the buildings. But the museum itself, the contents of both buildings, the employees of both buildings, um, and all the bills of both buildings are actually uh, done by the DuPage Growing Mill Corporation. And we are a not-for-profit corporation. We're supported by memberships, admissions, and sales of cornmeal, <laughs> and contributions <laughs> from those generous people who decide they want to contribute to us. Um, we have several part-time paid employees. But the real heart of our organization is our group of 50 volunteers who uh, demonstrate spinning and weaving to the more than uh, 6,000 school children who come through here every year. And in addition to that, we have another 10 to 12,000 uh, visitors, other visitors that come through. So um, volunteers are very important to us. That's a spectacular support group you have in the community. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I believe we'll be seeing some of those volunteers later in our yes, tour today. Yes, you will, definitely. You'll see our, you'll see our group of volunteers. Um, I'm proud to say, really, that the whole museum itself, the mill itself, and the fact that the mill is operating today is the result of a volunteer effort of a group of citizens from Hinsdale. And um, the mill actually was operated until like 1924 by uh, the Growey family, and then it was sold to another milling uh, organization. And after that, uh, modern milling methods just made this, farmers didn't bring their grain here any longer. Mm -hmm. So the building was then sold to the DuPage, uh, Forest Preserve District of DuPage County, and sat vacant for about 15 years until in the early 30s, the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC, did the, completed the restoration of the building itself, replaced the water wheel, and put back the dam so that it was functioning, and also the mill race. So the whole outside of the building and the water wheel works were completed back in the 30s. And then, unfortunately, the was, building was opened only for one week. And after that, closed down again until about 1951, when um, the DuPage Growing Mill Corporation was formed and uh, the restoration was completed. Um, a lot of it was volunteer. The big motor that operates our gears right now in our grindstone was donated by someone from Electromotive at the time. Um, people from local businesses actually sent their employees over here to do the work and paid their employees so that it was, it was a donation of labor. Uh, the restoration was completed, and that was back in the 50s, but the restoration was completed for about the amount of about $3,400, which I think is spectacular. That's amazing. Yeah. Without all the volunteers, uh -huh. it would never have happened. <laughs> that is just, that's such a great support that you have from the community. Absolutely. And obviously such a wonderful place for the community to that's come right. and learn. That's right. Um, and one of the most interesting things about this museum is that it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Yes, that's true. So <laughs> let's take a look at the display, and you can tell me a little bit okay. about that down here. All right, great. All right, great. During the um, pre-Civil War era, primarily after about 1858, uh, slaves were coming up through Illinois on their way to Canada. Uh, because in Canada, there was slavery was outlawed. In the United States, of course, in the South, there was still slavery was still, was still happening. So escape routes um, were generally along waterways. So most of the slaves that came through this area here were coming from the state of Missouri. And they would come up uh, one of the rivers, a lot of, most of the time it came up the Mississippi River and into um, where they might be able to cross. They used the I&M Canal. They would hide out on, uh, could sometimes have a ride on the railroads that came east. But they were coming to Chicago uh, basically because once they got to Chicago then they could take 
boat out of Lake Michigan, which would get them into Canada, mm -hmm. or they could also go by rail into Ohio, where actually the, was the easiest place and the, the closest place to actually cross the border into Canada. So they were, they were coming kind of northeast through the state of Illinois. And most of the slaves that came through here in what was called Fullersburg at the time uh, came through Downers Grove, uh, Wheaton, Glen Ellen, or Lombard, and came up. And the reason they were coming here to Fullersburg is because Ogden Avenue today was at that time the old Plank Road, which was the major highway and major thoroughfare into oh. the city of Chicago. So uh, that's basically it. And it was about a one evening's, one night's journey from uh, Fullersburg into the city of Chicago. Chicago had a large native black population at the mm -hmm. time, so they could pretty much easily mix in with those people until they could find a way out of the city and into Canada. Um, at that time, we, we know for sure, definitely, that there was Underground Railroad activity in Fullersburg. Mm -hmm. We don't have any written evidence that it, there was Underground activity really here in the mill itself. But uh, there's very hard to prove any of that because it was so secretive. Mm -hmm. Fines were very, very expensive. I mean, it could have been, and back in the 1858, $5,000 was a huge fine. And imprisonment. So people that were involved really did not want anyone to know. Yeah. Uh, our local blacksmith, John Coe, though, in his obituary, it talks about him being involved in the Underground Railroad. So we know definitely, and that was in 1889, so we know definitely that we can, we can say that there were slaves here. Supposedly slaves came in through the basement door here and spent the, the day down in the basement cellar here of the mill. So we're standing on the very place that, that slaves would have been back, back in 1858. So to go along with the Underground Railroad history of the growing mill, you also have some Civil War mementos yes. as well? Yes, we do. And um, two of our most prized possessions came from a local resident, Morel Fuller, who went to the Civil War when he was just uh, about 12 years old. And he was the drummer and he played the fife. This is the drum that belonged to Morel Fuller that he took to war with him. And this is the one that he signaled the troops um, again, they used those drums to relay signals to the troops on the battlefield because they could be heard over all the, the shooting, the musket shots and the artillery shots. And so they would signal retreat or advance or left wing, right wing advance. Um, back here uh, near where we have the gears, we also have just a little exhibit kind of to give people an idea of what it might have been like to have been here in the mill. This was what they would have slept on because Mr. Growey could not have had nice bedding down here because it would have given everything away. So he probably would have thrown a few grain bags on the floor, stuffed them with hay, and the slave, this is what, where they would have spent the day. Wow, that's amazing. And I can't believe how large this drum is for a 12-year-old boy to exactly. be carrying. Exactly. That's a big load. That's exactly right. That's amazing. That's right. Well, this is all fascinating. Let's go see some more of the museum. Huh? All right. Great. <laughs> Hi there, Russ. Hi, how are you, Brianna? I'm good. I hear you're the master miller today. For today, that's correct. <laughs> all right. Well, I would love for you to show me all about what you were doing up here. Uh, I'd love to do that. What we're going to do to start with is we start with corn. Starts on the cob. And we have to remove it from the cob to create grist because this is a grist mill and this is a form of grist. So we have to take it off the cob. You could do so either with your fingers. These are a little more difficult to do. I can give you one here that's already been started. And you can see, you take it off with your fingers is one way. That comes off pretty easy. If your fingers get tired, you can do it the way the Native Americans showed the colonists how to do it, which is with a clam shell. So okay. you take the shell, hold it like so. Go ahead, and then you just take and push down like so, okay. pop it right off, all right? So is that why we call it shelling corn? That's why we call it shelling corn. The term has stayed with it. A reason for everything. Exactly. Now, a hundred years ago, a man came up with a device that makes it even easier to shell corn, and that's this device right here. All right. This was invented a hundred years ago in August. We can take and put an ear of corn into this, and then if you want to take a hold of this handle here and turn it like so. That's right incredible. 
Want to try another one? Wow, yeah, bring it. Go ahead. Am I turning the right way? Go ahead. So it works kind of the same way as a meat grinder, right? Yep, and what happens is all these teeth on the wheel in here, as they catch the corn, they spin it and oh. pop the kernels off at the same time. So this is the this is a hundred years old. As of this year. Yep. That's so neat. So, m typical Americans find a more efficient way to do things. Okay. Now your next step is how do you now that you have corn grist, how are you going to make it edible? We have to grind it somehow. We have to right? grind it. Okay. We'll show you the way they ground it originally is right over here on this stone. This is a mono, and this this flat stone here is a matate. This is a Stone Age device mm -hmm. for grinding corn or any grain actually. You push down, lean on it, and roll and slide. You break it into small pieces and then each piece gets smaller and smaller as you keep going over it. The one thing I'll caution you on is keep your fingers out from under it. Okay. That band-aid's there because you don't I did don't always. Okay? <laughs> Alright. So don't try to do them all at once. Get, okay. a few, Get a few. Press down and slide it and roll it as you go. Like that? Kind of like that. Woo! Keep sliding it across. There you go. Yes. Keep going. Kind of a flattened out version of a mortar and pestle. That's right? right. Flattened out version. Now keep in mind, for your meal for today, you need to grind this much. Yes. Alright? That would be a normal person serving for a day. Wow. Lots of work. A lot of work. Makes you appreciate what you're eating a whole lot more. Yes, it does. Okay. Right now, we've got enough there for a small bird, maybe. <laughs> Woo. How am I doing? Doing pretty good. <laughs> How would you like to be doing that all day? I would not. Not at all. <laughs> Life is easier today. Yes. All right, so now the evolution goes from the mono and the matate to a quern. A quern is a earlier or primitive, if you will, version of our modern or 19th century mill, mm -hmm. the burr mill. And what you have here is you have a fixed stone on the bottom. Show you what it is. You have a fixed stone here. In the middle you have a wooden piece that sets the distance between the two so that you're not mm -hmm. grinding stone against stone. Yeah. That would affect the meal that you're eating. We don't want that. This comes down on top. This hole is called the eye. That's where the grain goes in. And then we turn this. Go ahead and turn it. And as you turn it, as the grain is ground, it goes out through the sides with by centrifugal force. Just fly it out. Now this is wheat we have in here, correct? This is wheat, right. Okay, let's see what you've done here. If we take this brush, Take the brush and brush it all around there towards over here. I have a little door over here. We're going to collect it all in this box. Oops, flower on the floor. You get all kinds of grains on the floor during the day. So now, this is a sieve, it's a box with a screen in it. If you okay. shake that side to side, keep shaking it side to side, the finer particle will go down through the bottom and the coarser materials will stay on top. Now, if you open that up, you'll see what you have here is whole wheat flour. So you've created flour. Now this is your hulls or your shells or bran. It's your fiber right there. That's your fiber, your bran. Pour some milk on that have breakfast cereal. There you go. Okay. That's amazing. That so is... that's another step. So you could do this with corn as well. You could, yeah. This Now what would happen here is this one is set too close together. Mm -hmm. This one isn't adjustable, such as our mill is over here. We're going to go over okay. here now. This is one of our two mills within the, the mill itself. And this is the complete mill as it was built originally. Okay, and this has several parts which we can see over here. Correct? That's correct. When the mill was restored in the 30s by the Civilian Conservation Corps, this mill was disassembled 
so that people could see exactly what's inside of this one. Mm -hmm. So we have the base stone and over against the wall is the runner stone that actually turns and does the grinding. So this is in effect just a very, very large version of what we were doing. Exactly, the of the quern. Okay. More modern version, if you will. Okay, so go ahead, right. pull it out, and you see the corn, pull it on out a little bit. There you go, now you'll see it coming down. And now you're feeding the corn into the eye of the stone. Okay, put it back in now, and just tap it. Okay, so now we have the corn in the eye. What do we do to grind it up? Next thing you're gonna do now is 150 years ago, <laughs> we would have activated that lever. Okay and it would have engaged the gears downstairs to drive the stone here. Mm -hmm. Today, because the dam isn't as high and the river's not as high, mm -hmm. we use electric power. So you're gonna push this green button right here, which is gonna start the mill. Vintage start and stop button. <laughs> The next step will be to bag it. So right. you can bring the bucket over to the bagging area here. Okay. Surprisingly. Right over the ear. There right. you go. Now you put the bucket in here. Here's the scoop. Okay. What we will do is you can start bagging that fresh ground cornmeal. We'll start out with a five pound bag. Ooh, all right. So we'll put this weight. This is the weight for the five pounds. This is our scale here. So you can go ahead and start putting the corn in the bag. Okay. Takes quite a few scoops to get to the five pounds. Now you shake the bag down a little bit and then you can put it over here so that we and then you can just start what you do here now is uh -huh. shake shake your scoop down so it's just about level so that okay. it doesn't spill on you. And then dump that in. You'll probably take a few more scoops. There you Ooh, go. There now go. you're at your five pound level. All right. Good job. Very good. My five pound bag of cornmeal. All right. Excellent. Awesome. You can get a job here. Sweet. <laughs> All right, now we are upstairs with Penny, who is showing us how to work a loom. How yes. are you today, Penny? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Good. Yes. We are weaving, here what we're weaving is dish towels. Okay. And, um, we had 30 plus yards of cotton on here and 15 yards have been taken off so far to make the dish towels. So I'm working on the second half of it. It took us five hours to put the threads on the loom, so that was just Which so are the think. threads that are the base of the loom are all these threads going out and down right. and around, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is, in order to put the shuttle through, this is this is called warp, the long threads going this way. Mm -hmm. And then when you move the um, treadles, it moves the threads and locks them into place. If you don't like what you've done over there, you just undo it this way. Just pull the threads back oh, out okay. and then just start again. You wanna try it? I keep working here. Really? Yeah. We're not, we don't usually, but Folks I've actually, this I've one actually worked a loom before. Have so you? Oh, well, then you're an expert. Remembers. And you don't want it. Yeah, you don't want it too tight over there. So Ooh, there you go. Good. Good job. Nice. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> now the other part of what we explain here is flax being made into linen. Oh, it's, I never it's, knew flax was the basis. Neither did I until I started volunteering here. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the, now we've grown it out in the garden, so this is what the flax looks like when you take it out of the garden. Mm -hmm. And it has, when it's growing, it looks like grass. Nice. Mm -hmm. And these little pods up here are purple flowers. Okay. And then the pods, what the pioneers would do is take all the pods off, they have the seeds. And we have a little bucket here of the that's what the pods look like. And then are the little flax seeds and inside then, of that? Right, and then that's the flax seeds. And they would save the seeds to replant. Mm -hmm. 
Well, those are very healthy for you. You should eat your flax seeds. Or, yeah, and get back to the these. animals and probably yep. eat them themselves. So what you would do is you pull this and it's pulled right out of the ground. You can see there's the roots and oh, everything yeah. right there. Dry it. And then after you dry it, it, it's a process called rutting, which you have to dampen it so that you get all these sticky outside things softened up. Uh-huh. Then after you've rutted it, you dry it. Okay. So I go to the store now for my clothes. <laughs> but anyway, after then what you do is you take the, this is, um, I'm, not, I'm only going to take a couple because it makes a mess, excuse mm -hmm. me. Okay. Then you put it through the, this and the, you want to break the, all the threads so you pr pull it through like this while you're, and it breaks off the, the threads on the outside. Oh. So, so you left it just it's that all the middle part. Right. So you get all that hard part off. And then you put it on the sketch board here and you do beat it some more. Generally, I think the men did this because they're probably better at beating things. <laughs> then after you have that all done, um, you put it through this Hatchfield thing here. Which oh my, is, that looks like a torture device. Yes, and I don't really like doing this because it's all like nails sticking up, uh -huh. but it, you pull it through like, kind of like that. And then you mm -hmm. end up, when you pull it through enough times, it ends up looking like this. I did do this, some of these this okay. morning. And the these are the long fibers. It kind of feels like horse hair, I yeah, think. Yeah, it does. And the short fibers are called toe. And here's some of the short fibers. And then you would you can make rope uh -huh. with these. And then this goes on a spinning, it gets made into a pigtail like this. Mm -hmm. And then you would use that on a spinning wheel and spin that into linen thread. Wow. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that that... They, yes, they, that they went through a lot to get their, their clothing made. <laughs> and as I let go of it, it twirls the fibers into yarn and spins it onto the bobbin. So this is Liz and she's showing us spinning here upstairs. This is amazing, Liz. And this is exactly how they did it for exactly years and years and years and pretty similar to how they still do it today, correct? Yes, it is. They even, uh, as late as the uh, depression, were spinning. And there are places in Europe that do still spin today. Would you like to try it? I would love to try it. <laughs> okay. So, come and sit down here. And I want you to just hold it just like that. Okay. Okay. And then... Put your foot on the treadle and give it a spin. You always want to make sure your wheel's going clockwise. Okay. I'll start your spin. I'll start your wheel for you. Oh. There you go. Oh, you wow. have to get That's kind of a feel yeah. for it. Now keep it that spinning. That definitely has a feel to it. Yeah, and then pull your fibers. There you go. Let's pull them. And she's drafting beautifully. <laughs> that drills hard. Yeah, it's hard to do two things at once, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> this is amazing how it just kind of naturally pulls into a kind of thread that you can feed through. Right, and you can see okay, that it's got I'm... lots of nubs. Yeah, I love on, that kind of on the fibers. Kind of nubby spin fibers. Them into yarn. Yeah, and then you leave the end fluffy to add right. more on. Right. So then you just grab another piece. Okay. And you might want to pull on it a little bit, accentuate it a bit. Okay. Don't pull too thin. But you can spin a gossamer fiber or a very thick. A uh, piece of yarn. Wow. Want to get started again? Mm -hmm. Ooh, another big chunk there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what So what we're working with here is it's just plain wool just right plain off wool. the sheet. So how do we get it to this state right here? Well, um, this is a Shetland wool, and it almost doesn't have to be carded, but we will card it because it makes it so much easier. So this is the fleece, it's just a piece of fleece that has come off the sheep. It says Shetland. Mm -hmm. So we take the, I'll let you do it. Okay. Okay. Get so this is just like more. a paddle with little fine bristles on it. Right. So then, and then take this like this in your other hand. Okay. And then just pull away from each other. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. Kind of like you're combing it against itself. Yes, sort of. 
And then when you get, you have a lot on this one, right? Okay, so then you can take it like this, and that will push it back onto the, oh, okay. the first one. Just kind of go back and then do it a couple more times. And sometimes, if it's real um, curly and real coarse, you might want to take it off and turn it over. There you go, you've turned it over now, and now you're carding on the other side so okay. you can get rid of the curl on the other side. And what this does is it just straightens out the fibers and um, gets rid of all the extra grass or stickers that might be in there and makes all the fibers going one way. And then you want to roll it off to make your roll leg. So just yeah, pull it off and just try to make it into a little roll. And that's what we have here is little roll legs as well. It's so oily. It's yes. oily. It, the sheep have a natural lanolin in them and that's what keeps their um, their wool from felting in the field. Oh, okay. Because if they didn't have this lanolin, then the wool would just felt and it would just be this big mess. <laughs> <laughs> and the lanolin is what people who are allergic to wool respond to usually as well. Probably, right? yes. And um, we are actually spinning in the grease here, which is why you feel so much of the wool uh -huh. in your hands. Um, wool is typically washed many, many times before okay. it's ever spun. And in modern day, they do wash it quite mm -hmm. a bit before they spin it. And they have, you know, automated spinners yeah. and spinning <laughs> machines that do all that nowadays. But um, we're actually spinning in the grease here, which is what a, what a pioneer woman would have done. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, those Icelandic sweaters, mm -hmm, they yeah. don't actually wash the wool before they spin them and that's why the Icelandic fishermen don't get wet when they wear those sweaters on their ships. Oh, it's like natural waterproofing. Right. It's just like the sheep. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that. This is so fascinating. <laughs> We're ending right here in kind of the guts of the mill area. Would you like to tell us just a little bit about how all of this works? Well, this large gear back here, which is called the face gear, uh, the shaft goes through the building and is attached, should be attached to the water wheel outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the miller opens the sluice gate to the mill race, which you, you will see outside, right, the water runs through the water wheel there, enough water pressure should happen so that this large gear starts turning and then it engages this cog, which engages this. And, you can see when these wheels are moving that each each of these parts will move faster and faster mm -hmm. so that eventually that last gear in the back which is the dark brown one is is fast enough so that actually the grinding wheel will turn oh okay and i know the millers talk to you about the speed of the grinding wheels mm -hmm. you know that now unfortunately that's how it should work with the water wheel but when they replace the dam they the dam should have been five feet higher so there's not enough water pressure generated to do that. So behind these beautiful gears are two big, huge motors, one that turns the gears and the other that turns the grindstone. But at least we can see how it actually would have worked Absolutely. back in the day. This is exactly. This is a real reproduction of, of the original set of gears. So neat. Well, thank you so much today. Uh, would you like to just give us a little overview so people coming to visit know? Oh, sure, sure. We're here. We, talk, we have a miller here doing corn grinding demonstrations daily. Uh, we have spinners and weavers, and um, we have the Underground Railroad exhibit. For groups, we also will provide a docent who will take the group through the museum and do a presentation on the Underground Railroad. And the museum's open, um, we open April 1st to field trips, and usually the Tuesday after Easter for everyone, and we close in mid-November. Reason for that is we have no heat to our third floor. <laughs> So, so it, it wouldn't be too chilly. pleasant after November. <laughs> That's right. Now, if people just want to come up, bring their families, what are your Absolutely. hours during the week? Tuesday through Thursday, Tuesday through Sunday, uh, 10 to 4.30. We're closed Monday, except for holiday Mondays when we're open. Okay. So. And we do have uh, weekend special events. We have at least one event each month, or two events each month, that are, are geared towards families. We do a lot of fun things as well. Neat. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sandy. You're this welcome. has been a great day. You're welcome. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today at the Grau Millen Museum. I'd like to thank all of our guests for giving us such a great look into the workings of a 19th century grist mill, as well as their great part in helping many Americans find their way to freedom. I'm gonna go home and make some cornbread. I'll see you next time on Yesterday Today.